Yeah. So anyway, so I would like to start uh, with the topic, which is like ED choices for me actually. And normally, um, since last year, I start to work with people that I let them choose for me, and I, that become my part of my pra uh, artistic practice. And I think, yeah, what ED choose uh, certainly fits in my uh, working area on collaboration, interaction, and participation. And I do think a lot in the last three years that how to work with artists and how to develop things better, and how we kind of uh, mediating things better, and how we kind of so called involved uh, with the artistic development, artistic projects into a certain kind of social context and what that really means. And the first thing I'd like to show is that uh, end of uh, 2014, um, I was commissioned uh, Royalty Ekida for a project in Shanghai for opening in uh, a new museum called the 21st Sh uh, Shanghai 21st Century Minshan Art Museum. And this is one of the major pieces. And he did, um, mm -hmm. He did it in a very particular way, which is like um, he modified uh, a project called the radar and into the location of Shanghai, which is like he got the data for years um, by analyzing the universe, with, uh, traveling stars and, and all the stars. <laughs> and um, but by putting just the code, I mean the the data numbers, location, and so on, and so on into it. So in another way, it's like what we see is what we normally could see through a telescope, that what happens in our universe. Yeah, it's very short video because uh, the whole work is about 70 minutes, 13 to 17 minutes, because uh, at the beginning it's kind of calculated and uh, um, live with, with the, the whole so-called movement of our universe. But then, of course, it's not so stable with the internet situation and so on and so on, so the work itself is kind of repeating. Uh, but in another way, I do think it's very particular that we consider of actually how we position ourselves um, on Earth and how we see the universe and what kind of matter. And I do think this, in this kind of certain kind of context that he created this gigantic uh, projection um, in Shanghai. So it's a, about 30 meter by 12 meter kind of projection. And um, at the opening, I think it's very kind of convincing for people, especially the bankers, because uh, Minsheng is a, a bank. And for the bankers, I think the, the work does speak to people in a very particular way. You know, like, I think, uh, again, in China, like, when you work in the arts, the uh, ideology issues are always important. So I think with that show, we try to do only showing um, the work with so-called um, very inno innovative thinking, technical thinking, conceptual thinking, but, you know, without reality. So I think this is this is what we try to do. Um, how you strategically dealing with curating and working with institu institutions, dealing with the local issues. Mixed. It's a mixed. Oh. Yeah. Because as a, it's kind of funded by Minshin Bank, uh -huh. but as you probably would understand, any big enterprise in China would be have a part of the governmental or whatever. Yeah. So um, I mean they started themselves. So in a way they set up the first kind of you know bank run museum in Shanghai and that the second one. And um, yeah but I mean it's a good question because it's never been clear. And even you know the MOCA in Shanghai is probably funded. So the kind of first one by just uh, a collector or uh, our lover, but at the end now they're kind of supported by the government. So I don't know what you know um, whether how you call it. Uh, yeah, it's it's, it's it's not so clear. But you know, as long as I stay in in Zurich, I mean, 
I learned a lot uh, from the Swiss system. I found a similarity in there. You know, like a lot of this kind of story behind <laughs> the facade is, uh, is rather difficult to understand. Yeah. And I try not to understand it. <laughs> um, but of course, I have a, a certain kind of ambition of showing the part of history I do understand, you know, what kind of artists we should support. So that was one of the artists, one of the legendary artists from Shanghai, Hu Jinming. So we kind of present his early work uh, from 1996 and in this context. So I do think also, uh, ironically, that we put something into the space, which we try to create a certain kind of uh, feeling that let people aware of, you know, the, for example, surveillance issue, mm -hmm. because this, this camera doesn't belong to the work. And, and this alarm doesn't belong to the work. So that was in the corner of uh, the museum. Normally, this kind of thing are, are hidden. But somehow, um, when you construct it so with a regulation, that this thing has to be highly visible, more than artworks. So, so we try to mix them together. And so I, I discussed with Nautis, like, why don't we put the, mo the hook uh, inside the TV, inside the cover, with all this together? And in the context of, you know, like aware of this kind of so-called a daily life, but a daily life in museum. And he liked it very much. So we did it in this way. And a lot of people came to take photos as I did, because they think, ah, oh, it's a very beautiful installation, you know. <laughs> With all these alarm, fake alarms, but actually they're true. <laughs> they're the real ones, you know. But I think it's, it's interesting because that's also reflect on Hu Jinming's early work in 1996, that he he did um, made uh, interactive installation on surveillance issues. He turned the public space into uh, our space, so people could choose and turn, you know, their channels to understand, you know. But actually, at the, at the end, they don't really understand what they're looking at. But now, nowadays, I think this is highly concerned for everybody. It's like what that means, you know. The camera just like front of your face, <laughs> and they catch everything. And also by, um, in that project, also by supporting young artists, that's the youngest artist in our show, born in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, very particular guy, because he's the son of Hu Jieming. He's Hu Wei Yi. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's very interesting to show the father and son in a very particular kind of context. And Hu Wei Yi got uh, two years before, oh. uh, sorry, uh, in 2013, he got residency in V2. So V2 people have tuned for constructing things. I mean, as he's kind of self-taught and, and educated by his father, he's very early involved in the art world. And I do think it's very interesting to show what he thinks and, and what he wants in, in this kind of um, so-called kind of gaming way of understanding um, culture. So that was one of the projects he found all these, like, early time portraits of the famous people during the Second World War, like Churchill, like Hitler, like blah, blah, blah. So like many people there, so they're kind of rotating in a little suitcase. The suitcase is real as well. So you can take the suitcase with you. And then there's a little connector that you can connect the suitcase because there's several cameras are hidden inside. So actually you're seeing a film then projected, but it's what happened is just inside the suitcase. But I do think it's a very innocent work that he tried to find this innocent moment, a beautiful moment of people as a child. And of course, um, a lot of more works were shown because the museum itself is, is rather big. Uh, if you've got time to see the museum, please, because it's like a little Guggenheim kind of style. So you have to yeah, like spiral. And then, you know, like, by dealing with the space, so we commissioned many artists for quite interesting projects, and like Adyal, the, the major uh, media artist now, born in the 80s, uh, he gave us this uh, kind of Ku uh, Sansui, you know, this uh, Japanese garden uh, um, kind of idea about what he called it. But it's actually come out of an uh, algorithm system that they've been working on for years. 
And um, there, this project looks very kind of highly official and ordinary that from Yang Zhengzhong. Um, he designed these two chairs, but when you sit on it, the chair was sl slowly going down, <laughs> which is like a, um, a quite, a, you know, like quite a humoristic kind of a metaphor, because normally we say officer, you never tell the officers what, you know, step down, step down, yeah, go down, going down, or step down, it, it means terrible for them. But as, <laughs> as an official, official setting, you know, this is normally from this uh, official um, so-called conference hall, you know, you have this kind of, I mean, yeah, anyway, so this is something very, um, very strange. You know, when you sit on it and it's slowly going on, because, you know, as I said, the museum itself is as, as a spiral, so it's, it's sliding. I mean, it's, and then if you get up, then the chair, the sofa goes backwards and go to the position there. So, so anyway, I think it's interesting that when you're dealing with the local issues, I mean, you still can make something rather political, but, you know, rather putting them into a very ironic way, not, you know, to, um, uh, but not by uh, creating too much kind of conflict with authority and making uh, the museum in trouble, that this work kind of passed by the Bureau of uh, uh, Culture in Shanghai easily. And I do think it is very interesting that how we get around, you know, with uh, thinking better and doing better with, with what we do, so called uh, insert something into the society, insert something into our actual. Um, to get your um, information out. And then, by putting them into the context, uh, you know, the, the backdrop, the, back, the background is a painting from Yang Feiyun, which is like a part of the collection of the museum. And it's on Song Qingling, you know. So it's uh, the wife of uh, uh, Sun Yanzi. Yeah, if I pronounce right. <laughs> yeah, Sun Zhongshan, because I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it in that, another language. And, uh, I do think it's very interesting to put it into uh, this kind of highly, highly political context because uh, Sun Qingling is one of the major lady uh, after 49 and the wife of the, of the Kuomintang founder. So I think, you know, then if you put that in the background, this in the front, you kind of describe the last hundred years of China. So I do think it's very interesting. But at the, on the side, a lot of people played with it especially children, and they loved it. So I think it's interesting that, you know, without telling people that so much of the political notions, blah, 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 but you actually bring it into uh, something very fancy and playful. And I also do think, you know, maybe that's only point that media art could achieve because it does have this aspect uh, of playfulness. And on the right hand side, uh, you see the, the person with the paw is actually um, the one of the most famous artists from the 90s, early 90s, uh, Song Dong. So we asked Song Dong to do a performance again, which is like he did in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1995 in the Hutong. And me and the museum director, Li Feng, and other curators, we all think this is very important to do something actually meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> because it is, it is like a kind of a self-irony, but also it's kind of thing that um, we should you know, always question what we're doing, um, whether it's meaningful. And then we asked an artist to travel to Shanghai uh, on the day of the open, opening day, and then pour, uh, boiling the hot water inside the museum, and pour from the center of the museum and to the gate, to the outer, outside gate. And then after that, I had a chat and with the artist and also with the museum director that um, he mentioned, he said, um, you know, at the end, I'm getting too famous now, very famous because he was in Documenta, blah, blah, blah. Very famous, but it's the same. When he poured the, hot, uh, the pot of hot water, Still not many people watching. Because for many people, this is uh, the dinner time. So they go upstairs, have their dinner, social time, whatever. 
not, but not many people are really care um, what he's doing. So I, I think that's, that's interesting, because for us it's highly touching, because then we know him, I know him since 1995. So I think, yeah, after these 20 years, actually what have changed? And this is a very interesting question. It's like you do bigger shows, you have a better money, you have a great museum now, but then what inside there? And what are people really concerned? And this is interesting. And in 2015, uh, which is like in 2014, I was involved with GNT that um, as a producer. So I produced this film called Poet on a Business Trip. And we showed in Hong Kong because of the Art Basel in Hong Kong, thanks to Adeline Oi, that we showed it. Um, it's a feature film, and we won several prizes. And the work itself is still showing in uh, Lincoln Center at the moment, until I think end, end of May or something. Yeah, America. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this film itself is kind of traveling everywhere. It's like uh, the most welcoming piece of work, um, because the film itself made in 2002. And it's focused on the situation of a poet. And the whole film is done by two people only, with a film director and actor. And the actor is real. He's a real poet. And they wrote 16 poems on their way. And I do think it's very particular, because particularly low budget film, and short time that they've been filmed it. And twice they've been arrested because they were filming in a very sensitive area. It's in Xinjiang, near Afghanistan, you know, all the desert, Gabi Desert, and so on and so on. And the film itself <coughs> is in, made in a way that, as a director, Juan Qi said, he tried to make um, uh, a Chinese work, but as a, country, uh, as a tribute to um, uh, Nagisa Oshima's Realm and Sense. So the whole film is, contains a lot of sexual moments and a lot of film, uh, lots of poem, a lot of things. So at the end, I think, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting that I know this film director. We know each other since 99. So we know each other for quite a long time after he's shown in uh, uh, Biennale in, uh, in uh, Berlin. Uh, which is like he made a very intuitive film called There's a Strong Wind in Beijing. And I do consider that film as a part of the, the video art history in China, but also as an experimental film in China. I mean, part of that history as well. And um, by working on this project, I do think you know, this work is, does talk to people because a lot of intellectuals saw this work and they cried. Because this is really something very special you don't see anymore. It's like 14 years ago from now, like before. And it's certainly very important to see the landscape, the people, and also the situation of the intellectual. Even that time, they feel the difficulty of being a poet. As a poet, you're very poor. <laughs> I mean, they're gathered in a very kind of uh, terrible situation, kind of um, little hotel. You know, they share beds and, and doing all these kind of things. Then they, they decide to make the film and decide to, to travel. Because as long as you travel to beautiful places and have your um, um, so-called um, sexual pleasures and so on and so on. So at the end, maybe you could forget reality in Beijing or Shanghai or whatever. So I do think you know, this work itself it just shows the beginning of the collapse of intellectual situation as today. So I show you a little um, trailer of it. Thank you. 
The poet himself is from Shanghai, so at the end we have to do the uh, during the post production I to ask him to uh, record his voice again uh, by reading some of the poem in Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and Shanghainese. And I do think you know with the, the Shanghai voice, uh, it's very important to show this work. And. Um, after the, the big show in Minsheng and after the film, so um, I was thinking of doing something that I could think of as a curator, but to <coughs> work on more constructing the system and how to construct the system better. So that was the project I started to invite a uh, foreign curator. So I invited one of my colleagues, uh, Mark Loiter, into the pro project, uh, and also the young curator from Hangzhou, Liu Tian. Uh, winner of the Young Curators in last year as well, um, to work with me together. So in another way, it's like we try to share the, the concept together and we try to construct it together. So in another way, that void, there's nothing more left but a, a little trace from human beings and being kind of interpreted into, um, I would say, three different channels, but at the end, it's, we formed it into one show. And I, I do think it's, a, it's a very um, important to work uh, purely on the um, so-called exercise of mind, because the whole show itself is you know, no actually big works. Uh, a lot of works are kind of highly minimal and on-site, um, but without too much of these so-called um, big gears or things. And I can show you one of the biggest work but it's just, um, the work itself, it just uh, catch the sunlight. Um, so the letter somehow been burned on the wood, on a very basic material. And this work I shown in 2013, one, uh, 2013 already, in the K11 Shanghai for the opening show. And that from Yan Lei, uh, a very particular work after his project in Documenta. When he worked with Volkswagen, you know, his work was kind of become the iconic work of last documenta. Um, then we talk about you know how to work on something um, reflected on it, and his way of working is highly conceptual, but also very much kind of uh, in inter kind of contextualized. So a lot of work of his cannot be really kind of understood, and a lot of people have to really like trace one work after another to kind of understand his whole system, then to get a bit of, bit of idea what he's really doing. So I think, yeah, that's an interesting part for us, and interesting part for, as a curator, is like uh, how to work with the artists. And I do think it is one of the core of the project. It's like how we understand of those artists, and how we understand and how we present this work into so-called this kind of um, a chance of that we're meeting with the public. But when we talk about public, um, what we reflect on public is also how we catch from the social media situation of the public. And this is one of the major work from a young artist, Yang Jingling. And he did a very particular work, series of works, which has not been shown before. He only do, did it because it's an online project. Uh, even he doesn't call it an online project, 
It's just like purely um, a kind of social intervention project. And he was like, we were talking and discussing a lot of why, what the meaning of showing it into a kind of art context. Because that was how he dressed. You know, right after the, the crash of the, of the express train. And he did that. He bring his helmet, he bring all these kind of security stuff. I mean, he was on the, he was on the old kind of media. And people call him the brother of helmet or self, self-helmet self brother or something like that. Mm-hmm. So then he becomes so-called popular online. And I do think it's very interesting that how an artist taking this kind of initiative but without kind of considering this is a art uh, project. So then I do think that's even more interesting when he did that, then we transfer it into the exhibition uh, kind of context to let people kind of realize um, what the Nazis have done. But also, I mean, the question being raised also since two years ago when I talked with the Hong Kong artist Guan Shang Chi and also Japanese group uh, Ching Pong, this is a similar question. It's like how you consider yourself, like what your identity, what your position would be in this society and how you're dealing with it as a citizen of the city, of the country, and as an uh, artist himself. And what should you do? Then I think it's interesting to work with him uh, to, I mean, have inventing this kind of discussion ongoing. I mean, this is not like end of the solution of making the show and that's it. So the artists still were kind of working on this kind of direction, but they're still working on a very even experimental way because he were trained and educated in China Art Academy and he have a very popular group called Double Fly. And Double Fly recently shown the last year with Hans Ulrich Ulrich and Klaus and Wiesenbach's show in the Long Museum. So I think this is interesting to consider, you know, what kind of position they're standing on and how they kind of negotiate and dealing with this, their reality. And by de- dealing with their reality, this is another artist we're showing in the project. It's called uh, Ethan Yohak. And he's from uh, uh, Pakistan. And I like his work a lot because he creates this kind of a dilemma of actually the situation of self, but by throwing a, throwing a, a, a chicken. And, uh, and I do think that the project is also highly kind of um, intense because, you know, uh, Beijing had this terrible chicken flu situation. So there's no live chicken anymore. And we tried to find it for months to get a chicken like from 200 kilometers away of Beijing and from a chicken lover who is like a collector of chicken. <laughs> and then we borrowed this chicken, uh, showed in the space. Um, so during the show, it's, it's interesting, you see um, so-called a relation between the chicken and human being because the, the people who are working in the gallery, they don't think this is artwork. They think, ah, oh, it's a, just a chicken, you know. But they, they kind of pissed off, like they have to really take care of the chicken every day. <laughs> they have to, yeah, they have to feed the chicken because uh, one day later, he will, he will not be able to eat anymore. So you have to feed him with water, food, and also at every night you have to put him back into the cage. And so on and so on. But uh, people loved it because people think uh, a lot of visitors loved it. They think, ah, it's a great sculpture. Because sometimes, you know, chicken have their special um, position. You know, they could stand without any movement. So people think, wow, it's a, it's a, it's a frozen chicken <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but actually when chicken move, they get uh, shocked. And then, but I think it's interesting that we've shown this work, we think of, you know, uh, again, the metaphor of how we're dealing with our own position and uh, our surroundings, but in a very kind of cruel, but also uh, feels like a fruitful uh, situation. And after the show, what interests me is like, when I talked to the gallery, I said, well, did you return the chicken? They said, yes, we did return the chicken to the chicken lover, but the chicken died. And I said, yeah, but I mean, he must get really good food and he get his show, you know. <laughs> and um, he said, yeah, but he cannot get back to the society. 
other chicken killed him. Oh. Yeah. So I think, yeah, wow. Very, very special for me. And that's another work um, we showed during this OID project from a German Italian artist, Catherine Bialka, meeting 40. Um, her work, I, I don't want to say too much. I would like to show you the work. Unbelievable. I don't get it. Can you tell me why do you do nothing? Fuck off. No, really, I mean it. Fuck off. Just shut up. Well, why do you do nothing? All day long you are so unoccupied. I know what I am doing and you please don't interfere. Just fuck off. <laughs> Tell me, don't you ask yourself why you are always just doing nothing? Holy shit, I can't believe that the only thing you are dealing with is what I am dealing with. That's crazy. Don't you feel pressure to do something? Anything? You are just doing bullshit all day long. No, actually not even bullshit. You are just doing nothing. Take care of your own bullshit. Do I interfere in your stuff? Do I tell you what to do? Do I ask you why you do it? No, you see? Unbelievable, I don't get it. Just do something else. Turn around. It is annoying. You always look my way. I feel observed. I cannot do anything private. I am sorry, but I don't get it. How? Why don't you drink a cup of tea? It will make you come down. Maybe it is best if you have two cups of tea. <laughs> or just call someone you didn't talk to for long. That's what people do. They call someone and ask, How are you? What are you doing? Gee, just call someone. I just don't get it. Occupy yourself with something but not with what I am doing. I occupy myself with what I am occupied with. And you please don't occupy yourself with what I am doing. That is just boring. Are you not bored doing nothing? I am doing something. You just don't know about it. I don't tell everyone, and especially not you, what I am doing. That's why you cannot know if I am doing nothing, because I am not telling you. I mean, it must be awfully boring to do nothing. Don't you have hobbies? You must have some hobbies. You are always talking about being occupied with something. You must love doing something. What are your hobbies? Tennis? Cooking? Or what do I know? Are you collecting something? Unbelievable. I don't get it. I don't collect nothing, but usually people who have hobbies also collect something. Wouldn't it be perfect for you? You should start collecting something. Let me see. Maybe you can collect. Well, I don't know, but you will come up with something good. You are not stupid, are you? <laughs> I think it's a perfect word to show to the collectors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also think it's a very beautiful work that done by this artist. I have this certainly self-irony. And she's cool. Yeah, very cool. And uh, the show itself is, um, we have a lot of artists, I, I don't want to talk each of them, uh, to introduce each of them to you. But here's another work that I work with Juan Qi, um, also as a producer, uh, a short uh, kind of documentary, experimental film, 70 minutes stuff. Uh, I would like to show a little part of it, because I do think it's, a, it's also, again, it's a very kind of politically concerned, but in another way, it's a, it's a great, great film that you don't, I mean, even you don't know this part of the situation in China from the 60s to the 80s, that you still kind of get a bit of sense 
of what's going on with our world. Fast forwarding it. Sorry, guys. I mean, the, the whole scene is still there. If you're interested, you can visit these locations. And they are no longer secret. But before the 90s, they were highly secretive. And a lot of people have been working there for 20, 30 years. And they still consider as nobody. Because they're not allowed to talk about it. And this is a place people get trained there as pilot, astronaut. And this is a secret army base. And that's, letters are from Mao's Red Book. Um, yeah, learn from the struggles. I mean, there are several, like five, I think five places like that. It's giving directions. So when you fly around, you could see these as a directions. But of course, as an English speaking person, you might not get any clue what's going on. The whole construction are done by, you see the black stones. And of course, then the work itself, 
been interpreted into many, many kind of political direction. But I do think with the artist, he tried to find this you know, individual life there and try to interview these people. I mean, for a person living around there for years and working on something heavy and patriarchal, yeah, patriarchal. Um, that, I mean, how you deal with uh, abundance of your life and the dream of the past of, the past of time. Where is this place? Uh, also in Xinjiang, near Gobi Desert. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. You can search for it uh, on Google. Uh, I think you will find the location even. And if you have Google Earth, you can try to find it. And I did find it on Google Earth. Yeah, I did. Oh. Yeah, they are still existing. What did you search for? The Just so-called big characters. Okay. Yeah, from the early Mao time or whatever. Yeah, you will find it. And it's like a. I mean, if you if you play with Google Earth, it's kind of like a game. And you think oh, it's interesting. It's something could be uh, you know somebody did it ten years ago. No, it's still there. Yeah. The film filmed in two thousand fourteen. Everything's still there. And then that lead to, I mean, from this work and also the, the work I did with thinking of constructing the system in the curatorial and artistic situation in Beijing, that this is the project I did in Russia, in uh, Yekaterinburg, in the Ural Banyu. So when I do this Banyu, the first information I got from my Russian um, colleagues, they said, you know, we have no, mon no money almost. So how can I do a venue? And then the second thing is, um, they showed us this kind of abandoned building, which is a, a beautiful building from the 1930s. So it's like the monument of the construct constructivist uh, architecture. And it's a building for the KGB. And I think it's a very, very particular uh, location. But the whole, the whole thing is almost destroyed. So um, then they said, yeah, of course, if we do show there, so you have to understand things can get stolen or completely destroyed. And you have to understand, you know, when people that don't understand art, they could do anything to it. Then, but I don't believe my colleague because I do think, you know, the Russian people are, are highly educated. And many interesting uh, people are, are still, I mean, from Russia. And, um, when I go, but when I talk to uh, the artists I've been working with, I, ask, I told them the same thing. Then I, I decided with them that nothing, nothing would, would ship down there. So there, there's nothing would ship from anywhere down to this location. As long as the artists could bring in their suitcase some kind of material they need. And the second thing is, we should hire people lo locally that in another way is like the whole project have to think about the circulation of money. That all the banyan money should not go outside of the banyan, should be all stayed in this location. And we should help the local people to get more job opportunity by creating, you know, in the name of creating our projects. And we did it. And I, I think um, that was another kind of so-called way of thinking how you can emerge in the, into the system, how you can interact with the society down there, and how you, encourage, how, how you encourage people to do something locally. Because normally we say, okay, this project is very, very much kind of a uh, locality driven uh, and, and so with a, a certain kind of social intervention aspect. Normally I don't believe, because I think it's very difficult to really kind of do something into the local context. This is not something uh, you can say, oh, I bring something in there so people get shocked and people get indirect. For me, no. Uh, this is just the way we say it, but this, there's, I, I don't believe there's a real kind of, uh, uh, how you call it, uh, real discussion with people on, on this. And I do think with our project, we did um, spend our time there. Like I spent a month there before, during, and a little bit after the exhibition. Uh, and also some artists I commissioned, like Xu uh, Tan, he spent uh, three weeks there, and been working and visiting a lot of farmers, 
and people working in the food industry and so on so on on his uh, uh, social bat batani uh, art project and I think yeah that's achieved a lot with a better understanding of what means daily life of the locals and how that changed during the, the whole political change that we understand and which is highly interesting and um, you can see the project um, here that I made a little map map uh, I also invite Ai Weiwei but not by showing any of his artwork I showed all his online online performance videos which is like you know show on BBC show on YouTube um, whatever Vimeo um, that I catch them all and showed there and um, I was trying to talk to them to talk to him said I want to show this and he uh, as long as he knows that I want to just show this, he didn't respond anymore. But I, I showed it. <laughs> and also the, the, the venue people said, ah, oh, do we get a problem? I said, I don't think so. Because he also didn't say no to it. So, <laughs> and, and a lot of these videos are, are already pub published and publicly online. And I also think, you know, by working on site, I also start to invite artists locally. So I had, I mean, locally around this area, also in Russia, a lot of artists, they cannot earn a living. So they do graffiti art. And it, it, even, it doesn't matter with rich or poor artists, they all go in the, in the night and do something <laughs> in the city. And I do think that's very particular. Because one of the artists de described it, it's like a, a life of a werewolf. You know, whatever you do in the daytime, in the night, you're wild. <laughs> and, uh, and no problem, you know, like even there's uh, one project, <coughs> we commissioned uh, a young uh, graffiti artist from Russia. <coughs> he decided to cut out all the advertisement faces, <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> and so in the exhibition room, we had about more than a thousand faces, like, cover of the room and, and then of course you know the police <laughs> and the company called the, the band director they asked the director you know why are you doing this to us <laughs> we're supporting your band <laughs> and then she said yeah but don't you think it's, it's, a, it's a great promotion then everybody knows you know? <laughs> and they, they agree with that so without finding the band they actually they said okay so we now we re replace all this cut out uh, advertisement with the new ones yeah because we we all say you know this is very ugly it's so dirty during the during the winter time you know uh, and they just put it there for maybe years or whatever and then yeah so I think with this kind of project uh, in a, in another way we're cre st slowly creating this kind of dialogue it's not only focused on the 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 issues I, that I concern. Or the artists are in my concern, but also focus on the issue that the local people concern. So I do think this uh, project um, made me uh, learn a lot from you know this area because slowly I try to find um, a way of how to work with the, the local people by by taking residency, by really working with people. That was one project I can share. I do think you know this is uh, uh, interesting experience. <coughs> and by the end of last year, um, I do a, another big project again in uh, Xiamen. Xiamen is close to Taiwan, Fujian area. Uh, at the beginning I thought, okay, Xiamen is part of China, so this place I should know. This part of the artists I know some, you know, like Huang Yongping, Cai Guoqiang, um, Qiu Zhijie, they're all from Fujian. So I know, I think I know this area. But since I, I'm there, I lived it for more than a month, like around two, two, three months. I slowly understand a lot of young artists actually have no idea of. Because they're not being included into the system in Shanghai or Beijing. So I can easily say that I discover 10 artists there I have no idea of. And they're really good artists. And then as uh, the project is collaborating between the Ahle Photo uh, Festival in France and uh, Three Shadows in Beijing, but also the owner of Three Shadows is also from this area, that would be able to make something 
more different. And for this project, I'm not, I'm not only the curator, I'm also the producer of the whole project. That allows me to invite more curators. And I do invite a lot of other curators, foreign, uh, Chinese, whatever, and also by converting a lot of artists into curators. <laughs> because I do think they could do a better job than me, because they should know who around them are interesting and doing well. And also like Hu Yi, the youngest artist I showed you before, he also worked with me as a curator for this project. So we, finally we had about 30 curators working on this project. And uh, then I was, uh, last year when I talked about this project, I said it's, uh, it's uh, all about uh, love and brokenness because I do feel a certain kind of um, chemical in the project that people really kind of talk to each other and share a lot of things. We live in the same building that the government offered us, this official building. You know, when, a, a govern, uh, when the officers take a rest during the noon time, they all kind of sleep there and like a dormitory style, but a highly, highly political, you know, like the sofa style, you know. And then all the artists, whatever, all our assistants, they, we live there. So we also invent a place, like a, a social place, you know, with a refrigerator, with projectors, you know, like a lot of people share a lot of things down there. But from this, I want to show two, this project, I want to show two particular work that I do think it's, it's a very interesting um, when presented in Xiamen, it's not only the issues in Xiamen, it's also the issues that um, encounters a lot with our everybody's daily life. That's from uh, a Swiss artist, Mark Lee, and the project is called Pick Me. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a star now. Like last year he had a three projects shown in ZCAM. He involved in three big shows. Then I was uh, with him in ZCAM and I asked, you know, it's almost like your solo show in ZCAM. And he said, well, uh, that's he's been working on for a really long time. I think since the last 12 years he's been working a lot on social media, on the politics of social media, on the notion of po uh, social media on this civilian issue and security issue of social media. And so he combined Google's and Instagram together. That everybody post a photo with tags me will be automatically kept into this project in five seconds. And in these five seconds, uh, he can trace you down your location. So in another way, it's like this person posts uh, completely down by his own uh, uh, view of posting a photo of, him, of himself. But then on the Googles, immediately you know where he came from or she came from. So I think this project for me is, is very, um, in one way it's very scary because, yeah, <laughs> There's no secret. I mean, you know it, and then you know it deeper now. There's no more secrets. And that everybody could know you in a way, not by, even not by this superpower, just by, you know, the basic power today, that, the basic technology today, that everybody can know each other much better in this way. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's like an online robot. It's still catching stuff. So, yeah, yeah. But like what we show there in Xiamen, of course, I mean, Instagram is stopped in China and also Google. <laughs> so we have to have shown a, a little kind of recorded piece. Otherwise, we'll show a lot of stuff uh, in, in China, I mean, on site. So that also shows the situation that you could achieve so-called this kind of international whatever aspect, but uh, in another end, um, you're kind of limited by the situation. You can only show part of it, but of course the concept is there, and as long as you can use VPN, you can kind of see the whole project uh, uh, live. And then, 
I was involved in another artist project. He was not an uh, artist before. Um, he trained as an artist, then he turned himself into a businessman uh, as a designer, owns companies, and so on and so on. But he always wanted to do art. And I know him like two years ago. He's a, he's a, a lovely um, sportsman. He plays parachuting, um, especially with this kind of mechanic parachuting. And he asked me to do um, this project with him. And I agreed with him because as an opening of the project of the, our whole festival uh, exhibition, and he said he wanted to find, his proposal was about finding the, the differences between a drone and a human person. And I'm the human person, so I have to fly with him. Terribly dangerous, and because, because the other day he flied himself and he failed. Yeah. But he didn't die. <laughs> he was lucky, he fell on a tree. But there was highly dangerous because the location itself is a construction site. And um, <laughs> I was very scared. Uh, but talking about the participating into an art project, I didn't think it's so dangerous like that. <laughs> And, uh, and I think, um, but of course, after that, I think, yeah, thanks to the artist, I learned again, you know, to facing this kind of situation because maybe my way of working or my life itself is too safe, it's too ordinary. In a way, I think, yeah, maybe I'm doing interesting work, but whatever, but maybe it's just too simple. <laughs> so, in another way, I, I think, yeah. With a project that on the October 27th, that is a, a day before the, the festival and the, venue, uh, the exhibition, um, it's like kind of revealing on the situation of our, our uh, positions that we should maybe do more and have better. Um, I mean, of course, we're thinking better is always one very particular issue, but also how you participate, you know, by taking the action is another issue. So I do think, you know, with this project that we try to combine that and, and we did it. And this is, uh, that's it. <laughs> this is the uh, institutions and magazines, whatever I've been working with. Is, and any questions? I think um, it's always 
so-called depends on what kind of level of the people kind of censoring it. Yeah. Um, because with showing one of the work uh, from a Swiss group, Bitnik, you know, they did the project with um, sending a parcel to Julian Assange, mm -hmm. which they succeed. And we showed them also in 2014 in Shanghai during this big opening of the museum show. Which is like interesting because for me this is highly political. And this, pro this work should be completely, I mean at the beginning it would be censored by the authority. But it, it didn't. Then I think it's interesting like does international political issues matters in China? <laughs> or why um, by turning it into the artistic kind of uh, context these works are allowed to be shown. Mm -hmm. But also like works are like from, um, you know, like kind of video artists um, are censored, which is, as a contrary, is, I mean, I don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Like for example, Yang Fudong, Haran Faraki, mm -hmm. censored. Mm -hmm. And they don't give a, a reason. They just say, not good. <laughs> so I think it's interesting of actually, every time you have to deal with what um, what could be sensitive for them yes. and why and also like when 2013 when I did the project with uh, I, I, I remember very clearly that I even think this is a great strategy that we did it together um, by inviting uh, Mian Mian the writer from Shanghai and also a, a theater group the grassroots grassroots stage theater group and we got information already <laughs> from the uh, higher, higher level um, officials and they said, you know, these guys are on our blacklist. I said, okay, yeah, interesting. And then uh, with presenting the so-called with application process, we didn't put these two artists in. So kind of we take it out first. Mm -hmm. And then during the exhibition, we just asked them to join in. So in another way, they, their work become temporary. Right. Yeah. So I think this is how we deal yeah. with the situation. But of course, the internet issue is like you never know what um, what really um, make so called this this current people are uh, angry or um, not comfortable. But of course, I think with art, you always have to find a way, yeah. and you always could. And I believe in that, yeah. because when we show this uh, piece, another piece called Dark Knight Shopa, is a, another work, it's highly illegal even, because the work itself has been shown first time in Switzerland, the robot been arrested. The police came to the gallery, arrested the robot, and they say, this is terrible, because the robot started to buy drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, it's the Dark Knight Shopper is like a, a robot kind of going with analyzing the data and, and stuff, and, but buying things from the Dark Knight. So illegal copies of writings, uh, like Harry, Harry Potter stuff, and illegal kind of branding stuff, like uh, fake Nike, whatever, and drugs and weapons. <laughs> so, yeah, so with this project, it's interesting, you know, when we show this project in Russia, and they were like, no. <laughs> We cannot let this project to be alive. We have to show it only as a copy of a recording because it touches their issue of weapons. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is interesting. You know, when uh, where to find the negotiating point and where you don't create, you know, something like yeah, you don't. I don't. I don't fight. I, I cannot fight. Yeah. 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 Even I'm uh, strong, but yeah. I don't like that. So I think you know, there's always a way for dealing with it. Uh, with our uh, local authorities. It's always a way that you have to think as a curator, an artist, whatever, you have to think to protect who helps you. Yes. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like you lose the base of work. I mean, I can make a very strong protest of my political whatever. So what? I don't change anything. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is about the history of art criticism mm. and how, how you feel about that and if you 
um, feel that the projects that you're working on are getting enough criticism within China and beyond, mm -hmm. um, particularly in uh, Hong Kong, we're very aware of the lack of art criticism. There are some writers regularly producing, and of course, yeah. there are some great publications, Run Down, Leap, are all fabulous. But how mm -hmm. do you feel about that? Does it bother you? Is it something that, you're, that you seek out to find writers in the hope that they will respond and create that critical dialogue? I think it's less and less internationally, which is very sad, yeah. which is I had described in the film. In the beginning of 2000, it's a collapsing, collapsing moment of our intellectual whatever, you know, from all aspects. So I do think it's, uh, it's interesting today that how we consider our position and what we can do being critical. And what means critical? So I think, yeah, in the past, I think as an intellectual position, uh, you could be crit uh, critical and that's enough. You know, people kind of um, take it seriously. And nowadays, like, if you're critical, okay, fine, you know, you will not get any place and showing your uh, opinion. I mean, they can even erase everything, because everything is digital, everything kind of controlled. I am not only talking about the Chinese government, I'm talking about everywhere. So that's why I think, you know, with Julian Assange's work, it's important. Uh, Snowden's work is important, because they let you know better of how people are controlling each other. And, and I think, you know, we're kind of building a cage for ourselves. So I do think uh, from there, then the, the critical position should change as well. So I think, yeah, what we critic, uh, how we critic, cri critic things. And this is important. You have to find a way of doing it, but also you have to embrace people. So in a way, like, um, I take it. Sometimes, like, in my strategy, like, if people ask me, oh, do you like this? I, I normally stay quiet. Mm -hmm. so, because I think, yeah, what should I say? Yeah. If I say anything, that, does it help? Uh -huh. I mean, I don't, I don't know. But of course, I think, in another way, like, as a curator, as a, a person right for whatever, I do think you know, what you show is what your, your political stance. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think you know, by um, think of kind of criticism, what is very important is like what you really want to speak out. You know, rather by just comments on things, like gaining likes <laughs> or thumbs, yeah. but you could do a lot. You yeah. could do, you can show a lot, you can, you can share a lot of other things. You do think, you know, I do think that a lot of things are, are kind of um, helpful with constructing some interesting knowledge. And are there, are there um, art writers mm -hmm. that, that you particularly pay attention to? Um, writers who you think are doing, doing a good job and are responding to contemporary art work in China? Yeah, I mean, they're also changing. They're also changing. I, I do like to combine them with the situation of uh, uh, Kevin Spacey's uh, interview. I think, you know, when, uh, when we talk about like Yu Hua, like, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, writers kind of writing about uh, the reality, um, and if we reflected on Kevin Spacey's uh, acting on the House of Cards, uh, people ask him, um, how do you think of your own acting inside the film, inside the, the TV? And he said, well, you know, every time I think I may, might overact it uh, as a political figure. But when I came home and sit down there, start watching um, TV on the reality, what happened? I thought, yeah, maybe I should act more. So <laughs> I do think, you know, that's also an interesting situation of what we think of uh, what intellectuals should, uh, should do, because they've been always kind of criti criticized. They say, ah, oh, you, you write too absurd stuff, you know, from the, from the area. I mean, it's, nothing would be too absurd like that. You should, you should focus on the beautiful things. <laughs> but, but then, of course, I mean, the reality is much more absurd mm -hmm. than that. So I think this is an interesting situation of uh, also a changing role of um, uh, a writer's situation that, oh, I mean, oh, any kind of uh, author's situation today are being challenged because everybody is a self-media. Self I mean, everything is kind of uh, well, wide, widely spread through a certain kind of a, a net system. I mean, it's not only internet, it's like a beautiful net system. So from there, I think it's interesting that you have to be aware of this 
and aware of what you what you're kind of transferring, whatever, what you're showing, what you try to talk about. But also you have to be aware of what you try to kind of um, uh, so-called distinguish the information. I mean, for me, that's a highly important. It's like today we're overloaded with information, but what is the useful information? And why is it useful? And part of the information, like what means knowledge? I mean, this is interests me. So I think, you know, by working with artists, working with writers, I do think, yeah. So the position, if the position and system itself been challenged, so we have to rethink, you know, what we should do. Are there other questions? Hi, um, I'm really interested in the fact that you're working both with films and filmmakers mm -hmm. and with artists. Um, mm -hmm. And I would like to, to know if you have any comments to, to say about um, what your work is different in, in which area and if you have anything to say about your position uh, towards the artist and the uh, artworks. Mm, I, I don't think there's a difference. And also, I'm, myself, I work as artist as well. Um, but also, like recently, I had my solo show in Beijing, and I said, uh, I'm not interested in taking this position as an artist. I just want to do some artworks. And I do think I have the right to do some artworks. So, so I think, yeah, I encourage, I also encourage myself that you could do everything today. I mean, the tools are there. Uh, there are a lot of people you can talk to, lots of professionals you can, you can ask. And it's only a matter of taking action. So uh, as I said before, it's like the matter of thinking, the matter of taking action. Can we combine that? And um, why not? Yeah. Uh, you brought up something that someone else said to, uh, during the week about mm. risk. Mm. Well, they said about risk, but mm. you said about safety. Mm. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit more what you mean by that, because mm. some of the work you've shown is quite risky, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe mm -hmm. what you mean is that, it's, that it was in some space, mm -hmm. secure, that mm -hmm. everyone knew that it was art. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you were flying, there was a different kind of yeah. uh, intensity. Yeah. That, and I was just wondering if you could just elaborate what that, that means a little bit more to you. Yeah, I mean, I highly um, understand this risk from my personal experience because when I do, uh, did a show in Beijing in 1999, I was being arrested for a couple of hours. So the police have to ask me all the questions of what this means, what that means, and, and so on and so on. Um, at the beginning, I thought, shit, you know, why me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, why not the others? <laughs> but then I think, yeah, it's a great moment. Because I do think it's a great moment that you never, they could possibly never came to a, a contemporary art show. But you could never could talk to people so closely like that to explain the, each, the meaning of each artwork. So I think, yeah, that's special. So finally, I think it's a great lecture moment. And, uh, but uh, what I'm saying, you know, starting from this uh, personal history kind of story, I think you know the risk is always there, and I highly understand that, and I'm highly concerned of that. You know what not to show to the public, and what not to talk too much to the public. So I think you know I, I'm, I think myself itself, you can call it as a, a filter. Um, with an artist, some of the artist project, um, I think is highly dangerous. You know, if you're working with a biological artist today. It's highly, highly dangerous. You know that could turn into something uh, like a disaster. Even a lot of people are not working on the real biological thing, but the only conceptual thing. But I know some people working on the real thing, and I do think it's a, it's something you don't want to just bring it into the public. And also, I think the risk is from many aspects, not only politics. It's also other things, and also the risk is not only my risk, the risk for the artist, risk for the institution. The risk for whatever I think you know as a curator is like it's a, it's a total thing. I have to I have to I have to balance, and I, I think um, the best is let the show come to the to the final um, stage, you know, which is like facing the public. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, all your effort, all the artist effort, all the institu institution effort is nothing.
<laughs> Quick one. <laughs> About to go. <laughs> Yeah. 2000. What, what were the, can you just say what you think some of the conditions were that gave rise to that? Um, I think at the beginning it's only a so-called uh, prediction of what happened. But now it's really the reality. Because if you look into the internet, look into the, some of the newspaper or books you're interested, not, not people anymore. But why? Not needed. Because I think the world itself is changing so fast. Um, in another way, that we're taking over by this um, virtual economy situation. Because I, I always mention that into my projects. Even the project I did in Russia is called No Real Body. Because they don't need a real kind of core of, of knowledge anymore. They want this kind of shared situation. They want this kind of this, this connected. Uh, sense, and I do think you know that's important. It's also like, of course, I do understand a lot of intellectuals still kind of fighting for the position, but if you think of this position, of of the so-called the system of distribution, it doesn't match anymore. So I think that's another aspect that I do think is very uh, very sad. If you think about you know um, a special art film or a special art book. How many people are reading it? How many people are watching it? It's not a matter of their quality. It's a matter of the system itself. And if the system doesn't take you, I mean, this is the logic. If the system doesn't take you, they think, ah, this book only sells 10 copies. We stop. We give it back to you. I mean, at the end, nobody wants to work with you. So I think this is the situation we're facing now. I, I also recently talked to people and said, well, before if you fight for your political positions, now you should fight for your intellectual positions with the whole system. And how can you do it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Special.